Chapter 4 Fresh His mom had called it a new beginning. She, she said he should think of it as a fresh start. Those were her exact words, like she had memorized them from some drugstore greeting card. You're just going to have to trust me on this one, she said. Well, what do you say to that? So Eric nodded, looked at the floor and said, Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes, he trusted her. Yes, he loved her. Yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. What did she want from him? Rainbows and unicorns? So she sold the house. Eric said goodbye to his friends, and they, and the fractured family headed east. They drove in a car behind a rental truck through Maryland and Pennsylvania into New Jersey and New York and finally across the Throg's Neck Bridge and onto Long Island, his brave new world. Bellport was his mom's old hometown. She still had a few friends there from back in the day. The support she claimed she needed, and most important, the promise of a good job selling medical supplies for some big company. Bueno bucks, she commented. Plus, his mother confessed, I always missed the ocean when we lived in Ohio. The salty Atlantic. There was even a bicycle path you could take all the way to the Jones Beach boardwalk. She couldn't wait to smell that briny breeze again. Eric didn't care, and it was getting harder to pretend he did. The way he figured it, there was no such thing as a new beginning. You get one life, and it rolls out like a long hallway carpet. It begins on the day you were born, and keeps rolling until you drop. There's no refresh button, no start over option. At night, when he was alone in bed, that's when Eric felt it the most. Fooling nobody, not even himself, no matter how hard he tried, Eric missed his dad and couldn't stop thinking about it. Not lonely, but worse, alone, abandoned. He promised himself that if he ever saw that man again, Eric would turn his back and walk away. See how he liked it, stick in the knife and give it a twist. Eric had seen other families break up. He got that part of it. He just didn't want it to happen to his family. And definitely not the way it happened, with his dad flaking out. Lots of dads moved out, but usually they bought a house in the next town or an apartment down the road. They had weekend visits, dinners at lo lonely Italian restaurants on Wednesday nights, coached Little League, and bankrolled big summer vacations. Not Eric's dad. He just lost it, stopped going to work, stopped functioning, and eventually just dropped out of sight. Gone, daddy, gone. He left and never came back. Even though he kept saying he would, or was it that he might? His mom said that his father went off looking for something, as if he were searching for a lost lottery ticket. He'll be back, she used to promise. He's just struggling right now, she said. It's not his fault, but weeks became months, and the months became years, and his father never found it, that missing something. He never showed up again either, which led them to Bellport and the necessity of a fresh new start, like Eric's actual life was some kind of new and improved fabric softener. How does a father do that? Just screw up everything. He sent CDs, though. That was the big joke. Every once in a while, a padded envelope arrived in his father's handwriting addressed to Eric. He made these random CDs, mostly filled with classic rock, Stuff like Credence Clearwater Revival and Bob Dylan and the Allman Brothers, music the dinosaurs used to listen to back in the Jurassic, songs he felt Eric might like. And he was mostly right about that. The tunes were pretty good. His father phoned so sometimes, too, but never seemed to say anything. It was like he was in a fog, his thoughts confused. He just wasn't the same man anymore. For sure, he never said one thing that Eric wanted to hear. He never said, I'm better now. I'm coming home. Some dad, huh? Just swell. He called yesterday. Eric didn't even know why. It was a question he kept wanting to ask, as if he had the cor as if he had the courage. Why are you calling, Dad? What's the point? The phone got passed around from his mother to his little brother, Rudy, and finally to Eric. The conversation was brief and awkward, as if his father was tired, talked out. Eric kept thinking of it this way. It was like his father was a great bird that had flown away, and all Eric could do was watch that bird drift into the distance, smaller, smaller, until it seemed to vanish completely, lost in the clouds. 
It felt a little like a death, a wisp of smoke vanishing in the air. Gone, but not forgotten. So, okay, the phone calls didn't go real well. Or maybe Eric just wasn't very nice. You probably hate me, his father observed. Eric didn't answer. He recognized the code. He knew it was really a question, a desperate request, and he heard the ache behind it. The answer his father was looking for was something like, Oh, no, Daddy, don't worry about us. You're still the world's greatest dad. Like on those coffee mugs you see at the mall, the lamest Father's Day gift ever. But Eric wasn't a little kid anymore. Not like Rudy. He was 13 years old, lucky 13. He tried to roll that with a pair of dice. And the truth was, Eric just didn't have to give it. A part of him had been ripped out like the stuffing from a pillow, so Eric remained silent on the phone, kept his father waiting. If Eric listened very hard, he could almost hear his father's twisting in the wind, the groan of the rope, a little revenge that didn't make Eric feel any better. Well, I guess that's it, his father said. You don't have to say anything, Eric. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just can't. I, I can't. Click. And he was gone again. Call over. Eric looked at the phone in his hand, shot daggers at his mom, snapped it shut. He went into the kitchen, looked for something to eat. A bowl of Rice Krispies, some pretzels, anything. His mother barked something about dinner being almost ready and not to spoil his appetite. Rag, rag, rag. So he grabbed his iPod instead, slipped open the back door, and parked himself in a lawn chair. Eric turned the music up, let it pour into him, fill him up. He had downloaded the songs from his dad's CDs. Eric did not curse or cry or seem to feel much of anything. It was all just a swirling mass, a crazy mess inside his dumb, numb skull. He closed his eyes and heard Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page pick out the first notes of Communication Breakdown, rapid fire like a machine gun on the open E string before hitting three big chords, D, A, D. Then singer Robert Plant's siren wheel, Hey girl, stop what you're doing. It had rained and some worms crawled from their holes out onto the brick patio. Eric grabbed a stick and idly poked at one, turning it over. That's how he felt, he decided. Just like that worm, pushed around, prodded by a stick. After a while, he'd crawled back into his hole, and then in a few days, off to school. A new hole with red bricks and homework. It would be a fresh start, a new beginning. Isn't that what his mom said? New and improved, guaranteed, or your money back.